Hi, welcome to Someone Else's Movie, the original podcast where an actor, writer, director, or nebulous industry figure gives a little love to a movie they didn't make. I'm Norm Wilner, I'm a programmer at TIFF now, and this is the other thing I do. My guest this week is Joris Jarsky, an actor you might know from Wayne Earp Earp or Saw 5 or Bad Blood or October Faction or dozens of other film and television appearances. He can currently be seen opposite Tandy Way Newton and Jefferson White in Julian Higgins' stark new drama God's Country, which is now playing in the US and Canada. And yes, I had Julian on last week. That's how much I like the film and what Joris does in it. Joris picked Moonstruck, Norman Jewison's 1987 comedy about declarations of love among New York's Italian-American community and the agita it brings to both the declarer and the declaree. Cher won an Oscar for her performance as Loretta Castorini, whose engagement to the bland but pleasant Johnny Camareri, played by Danny Aiello, is thrown for a loop when she meets his younger and far more passionate brother Ronnie, played, of course, by Nicolas Cage. But Loretta's not the only member of her family dealing with this stuff, and John Patrick Shanley's screenplay expands outward to explore the ramifications of romance and temptation among the various generations of the Castorinis. It's, uh, kind of like an opera, you know? This is someone else's movie. It's funny, I had a, Luke Kirby, who was in theater school, a year below me in theater school, he lived, when he, one of his apartments in New York 15 years ago or something was, was he was downstairs from John Patrick Shanley. And then, uh, and then the teacher I study with now has a relationship with John Patrick, John Patrick Shanley. And then I've loved Moonstruck since it came out. And then, uh, and then last in 2021, I was given a uh, uh, best supporting actor award at the Tribeca Film Festival. And he was the president of a jury, but I couldn't go. So that's, I feel like at some point I'm supposed to meet that guy. I just keep, he keeps just fucking circling around me. So I'd, hopefully someday I'll get to meet him just to, he's one of my heroes, really. It was a lovely conversation. I have to admit he was as good as I could have hoped for. And this is actually a great way into the episode. Yeah. Um, so yeah, what, what brought you to, like, why of all the films, of all the movies and all the theaters in all the world, what brought you to Moonstruck? Um, you know, I, I definitely, when my first thought was, oh, I better think of something like obscure. I'm a cool guy who was a film guy and all that stuff. And sure, I could have done any number of films like that. But Moonstruck, I love, there's not a lot of people that haven't seen Moonstruck. But there's still a fair amount, and I always love being like, "Have you seen? You've got to see Moonstruck." To me, it's I. They don't seem to be able to make movies like that anymore. I don't know if it's just there's. It's almost too sweet and charming. We're just not in that space right now to to, I guess, take those things in. I'm not sure, um, but it's sweet and charming without being. Um, gooey at all it's not a gooey film it's it's real like all of the things in that movie are are uh we can all relate to it's real. it's it's a very human all of it's a human story there's there's you know three generations it's about family it's about love it's it romance there's some magic realism in it and uh and it's really it's just an optimistic lovely film and shares a, amazing in it and it's my favorite Nicolas Cage performance by a million miles he's so good in it when I watch him in that I think I'm always I'm jealous because I I just think god I would love to be able to do that someday be that just kind of out there and he doesn't even there's no self-consciousness of his Nick Cage thing I don't at all he's not winking or anything it's just he's just doing who he is as an actor or an artist or any, you know, um, yeah, I just, I love the stuff with him and Cher. And then the opera and New York and uh, Olympia Dukakis, like the cast is amazing. It's just from top to bottom. There's nothing wrong with that film. I, I'm, I think I've seen it at least probably 15 times. There's nothing wrong with it. Every time I watch it, I'm just charmed by it. And um, it doesn't seem like it's trying to do it on purpose. Like, it's not going, we're going to give you this nice little, it, it's really based in the characters and the story. And it doesn't ever betray that. They don't ever betray that the, um, the integrity of the journey of any of the characters by, um, by, by the knowledge that they're like, we're trying to make a charming, likable movie for everybody or something. It doesn't seem like that. 
seems like that was that was just what happened because they hired an incredible cast and the director was able to put everybody in the same movie and um and get everybody on board um to you know live in the same reality of what they were doing yeah it's a really interesting film from norman Jewison specifically because here is a guy who you know you look back at his work and there's no signature like there's no authorial flourishes there's nothing maybe occasionally his musical score taste tend to, to go towards the highlighter version of everything where it's you know he's telling you how to feel yeah but I think Moonstruck is actually perfect for that because the script is so specific that if he had tried to influence it in any way, it yeah. wouldn't have worked. Yeah. And he just knows to get out of the way. Yeah. And getting yeah. out of the way in this case also opens the door to Nicolas Cage and and lets him go as high as he does, like go full opera. Yeah. Yeah. In a way that feels organic, right? Because nobody else is being directed to balance him. And in fact, the whole point of his character is that he is the counterweight to what Cher is going through, right? That their relationship depends on him being as huge as he is to coax the life out of her. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And it's and it is like it is yeah, he's this operatic guy who's still pissed at his brother about the accident about his his hand. That's like not even that great of a prop hand like it's the other arm you know it's so obvious but it's um, it's just he fucking believe part of my French he believes 100 yeah. percent believes it and yeah you're absolutely right and it's a sign of a great director that lets Julian has talked a lot about that um getting to set and that you you have as a director to get out of the way of the actors you've hired them now you and now you and you have to you have to trust them it's not your character anymore. It's now the person playing the role and you have to let them do their thing. And it might be different from what you imagined, but I, and he's even said this, like, I think, if, you know, there's a bunch of things that have to go right, but if you get out of the way and you're able to still do your job as director um, in how that shows up dealing with that specific actor, you usually end up getting what you want or better. Yeah, it's um, it's funny because I keep thinking I keep thinking about what it was like to see it. Did you see it in eighty seven, like in theaters when it opened? Yeah, with my whole family. Okay, what was that like? Amazing. My I was lucky that my parents uh, were you know we would have seen it in a um, I don't know what you would call them like we at the review cinema or like a B. A, a, you know, like a rep theater, a rep theater. Yeah. Um, we saw all that stuff at the review or the Kingsway or Bluer up on Bluer. They were, I wouldn't call them cinephiles, but they were definitely interested. In, it wasn't, you know, we weren't going to see Rambo. Um, right. My dad showed us like coming home and Milagro Beanfield Wars and Gandhi and mission and um, all kind of you know, interesting movies that might, I guess said something. Had a were, had a purpose to them other than just uh, a movie, movie, and which there's nothing wrong with that, of course. But um, um, although you know, um, you a could case argue, could be made. Yeah, exactly. For for Moonstruck is it's it's almost like my my favorite movie, movie really. But um, um, and my dad, but also at the same time, my father loved Blazing Saddles and all that kind of and Steve Martin and all. He was a massive fan, you know, Woody Allen. All, he, tons of Woody Allen stuff. All these, all these dudes that we now it's like gives you. You look back and you're like, damn, uh, Woody Allen, Bill Cosby. We watched every episode of the Cosby Show together. Mash every episode of Mash as a family we watched together. It was a, you know an event to last Mash. We were all there by the television watching it. Makes I get emotional even now talking about it. Yeah, yeah. You know, those collective experiences, and they're just. I mean, I'm assuming they still happen, but they just happen at individual discretion, right? Like, it's not like the thing is on now and you have to see it. It was it was like that yeah. when Moonstruck opened. I, I saw it. I don't remember who I saw it with. I think I went with a couple of friends, but um, we saw it at the Yorkdale uh, Cinema, which had just been renovated and had wow. these nice new theaters all tucked in there. And it was really fascinating to watch an entire room not know how to handle it. Yeah, because it is it's like I realized, too, in retrospect, this would have been a lot of people's first experience with Nicolas Cage. Like if they hadn't seen Valley Girl 
or or Raising Arizona, which came out earlier that year, but was definitely not the same audience. Yeah, yeah. It would have been something. And uh, I remember there was this sort of uncomfortable shifting for the where's my girl, where's my hand scene. But it's by the end of the movie, we're just as one over as, uh, yeah. as uh, Loretta has to be. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the movie, I mean, it's about passion, I think, in the, like, love, passion, and family, the, you know, the, the, um, the belief in true love and, uh, and the journey of it, because you have the, 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 the new love between Sharon and Nicolas Cage, and then you have the, 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 her parents. And so that, that generation and what they're dealing with and the father who's got something on the side and all that stuff and, um, what it is to be in relate in a, in relationships and yeah it was you know as a kid i didn't really that well i mean i didn't have a deep as deep an understanding of that stuff as i do now obviously but i mean i was swept away by that the romance of it as a kid and 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 also nicholas cage just as a kid that he's obviously very attractive and attractive you're you're just so big and you think oh man that looks like so much fun yeah um and maybe it's different now i don't know but you you could really as a whole family everyone we all enjoyed it for probably different reasons on some level but um you know we're all my my brother probably was 14 Came, when did it come out in 87 november yeah yeah so i was yeah so i wasn't that age i was 13 so he would have been 18 so yeah it was a fairly big difference between 18 and 15 and then tim would have been 7 16 yeah so yeah it was uh yeah, I just, I, I don't know. It's a, just a charming, lovely film. Yeah. Well, and as you pointed out, it can be appreciated by different generations at different stages because the, the kind of genius of Shanley's story is that he's got this platform structure of, of all these other characters having their own love stories, having full lives, not just being yeah. lively supporting characters with one affectation or trait apiece. There's yeah. a lot of stuff going on. There's, um, yeah, there's so a, much. Story, story, and story, there's all, everyone has something going on. Yeah. Even the dog. <laughs> <laughs> it does. Yeah. 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 And, the, and the, the weight that's given to the individual stories, like there's a reason Olympia Dukakis won supporting actress as well, right? Like yeah. she's yeah. so good in that. I got to talk to her maybe 10 years ago when she came oh. through with uh, Tom Fitzgerald's movie. Oh, just a legend. She's uh, a yeah and she just said like it was the best written part she'd ever had she just she got the script and it's like oh this is good i can work with this yeah. and that was what shanley did he saw every single arc as worthy of you know consideration and and humanity and depth and just like i had forgotten john mahoney is in there yeah, just sort of stumbled across like he pops up and like oh my god of course he's in yeah. this and yeah. he's so good and so quiet and it's like that one time, I think, in his entire filmography that you're vaguely allowed to remember he was born in, I think, Belf. Like, he's Irish by birth, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. Um, came over as a kid and, and almost never had the chance to be just charming, like to just occupy space without being um, a foil or, yeah. or a, a comic relief character and just sort of be debonair. Yeah, yeah. You could make a movie... I mean, really, any of those characters, you can make a, just a movie about just them. Yeah. Moonstar could just be about Sharon Nicolas Cage. It could just be about Olympia Dukakis and, and um, uh, who plays her husband. Um, oh, Vincent Gardinia? Vincent Gardinia. Like, and that's what's, you're, in, you're, you're in, um, engaged in all of their story. You're concerned, you're, you're following all of them. You're not waiting, like, when is Sharon going to get back on screen? Like, you're, everyone is, you're happy to see everybody. And, and because, I mean, yeah, of course you love that script. And so when you get in a movie like that, it, everyone wants, I mean, I, I'm assuming everybody wanted to be there. Everyone was brought their A game. And um, probably down, I have, you, you can end up on sets like this where everyone's, Everyone is just one hundred percent engaged because they they love the thing they're making, and sometimes that does happen right down to a PA. You know, yeah, even, uh, in God's country, one of the grips uh, months after we actually yeah months after we finished 
we finally wrapped it after we came back after the pandemic. He has a tattoo on his inner bicep of a silhouette from the movie when I'm punching my brother in front of the burning house. There's a burning house and it's me. <laughs> He's only, because he loves, every, every, people loved, they just loved working on the movie. That's great. And yeah. you don't hear about that. Like you only hear about the stories where everyone pulls together under arduous conditions, right? Like when, when you're talking fondly of a film, it's the thing, the idea that you survived it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Moonstruck doesn't feel like a movie anybody had to fight for no. after it was fin after it was built, right? Like you cast it, you set it up and then, yeah, you just get to bask in it. And the, there is a warmth. There's a warmth that allows for the foolishness. And also there's a, there's this sort of, I don't know how to explain it. And I don't think Shanley's the only writer who does it, but he does it consistently. He just punctures his own self-importance as a writer by having characters call each other on bullshit over and over and over again. Yeah. Like just that whole runner about how I think they want the rib back and it's immediately dismissed with the woman just going, oh, come off it. You know, like, yeah. just stop, don't do that. Or even just like Loretta slapping Ronnie and just saying snap out of it after this huge profession is just refusing to take him at his word. Yeah. And that's the Oscar clip, right? Like yes. it's her reaction that sells his performance. Yeah. That's a great point that Shanley doesn't, you know, the director, like I said, they, you know, get out of the way of the actor. Shanley, he writes for the character and for the story, not for himself to make himself look, look at me go like, this yeah. is obviously a Shanley piece. Like he's it, that, that's the other thing. It's like, when I knew I was, I chose this movie, I had forgotten he'd written it. I look at him, oh, John, of course, John Patrick Shanley wrote, you know, it was like, yeah, of course. And he, he, I don't know for sure, but I would assume he loves actors. He loves the whole thing. He loves stage film. He's a, he wants to be around that. He's not, for him, handing it over to a director and a writer is not like, okay, well, let's see how they screw this. Like I did it perfectly. Hopefully they make it as perfect as I did it and make it a John Patrick Shanley sh thing. It doesn't, he doesn't seem like that at all. He, he seems to, um, in my opinion, stay in his lane. Like he does what he's supposed to do and he gets out of the way. Yeah, as a director, he's actually taken broader swings, I think, than he has as a writer. Uh, like Joe versus the Volcano is just a cartoon with people in it. It's um, it feels more like a Coen Brothers venture than anything else in the early yeah. scenes, and it just turns into something truly ridiculous and Technicolor. Um, then there's like uh, a, a wild a wild mountain time, which is a really almost flat treatment of a fable. Like it's yeah. it's it avoids tweeness by being um, grounded, sort of in the tweeness, and it it builds to something that I still think is nuts but works in the moment because you just can't believe the film's going for it and then you can't believe that everybody else is reacting to it the way they are and i and i refuse to say a word about it because for those of you who are listening who haven't seen it it's kind of unmissable for what it does and for for yeah. the choice that it fully commits to yeah. and in there you also have this great louche tiny role for john ham as as a guy who's just stolen or who's shown up who's been in New York, who's shown up in Ireland with the, with the express intent of screwing over his cousin and stealing his cousin's girl. And he yeah. plays it so unapologetically that it's like, I would follow him back to New York and watch that movie. I want to see what he's doing. Yes, yes. And I, that, you know, like their magic realism stuff a bit in, a little in um, um, Moonstruck, he, he, there's always something he always has an element of there's always something bigger and more important going on than just the, it's not just a love story. There's something else going on that's bigger than us. And I, 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 which I, be, you know, I believe that to be true in, you know, in life. And so he brings that in and I, um, um, and it gives, it gives us, it allows us, I think by doing that, it allows us to experience the, the, the stories uh, in, inside of his work. Um, it just, it's another layer of humanity. Like, yes, there's this, the kitchen sink stuff of life, but then there's also this other stuff out there that is out of our control, whatever that might be, God, universality, we're all connected, who knows? Um, 
the beautiful moon in the sky, the magic of just that stuff of stars and these kind of things and a beautiful night and, and our, our minuteness inside of that thing. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's mythical and specific at the same time. And he can do that without tipping his hand in one direction or the other, which again, he can do that as a director because he's in control, but here it requires everybody understanding what he wanted. And somehow this really surprised me. This was never a stage play. Like it feels like it could be. Totally. And I'm surprised it actually, I mean, it's, I, I, I'm not, I won't be surprised if I find out two years from now it's on Broadway and it's some musical or something. Cause it had a bit of a revival during the pandemic. It was at one point the most watched film or something. Hmm. And uh, cause everybody's well, together. Yeah. And it was just a great, it's a great film to watch during the pandemic. Like, what a great film to watch. And uh, um, I won't be surprised because, yeah, you watch you, you 100%. You could almost change nothing and have it be a stage play. Yeah. You just add a couple of like, basically, you could do a jukebox musical of moon songs. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it practically is anyway. A hundred percent. In a self, in a self-aware way, but not a self-conscious way. And yeah. I don't want the characters to start singing, but there are points Me. in the movie where they could. <laughs> they like could. It actually could happen. Yes. Yeah. Me neither. But, you know, but I could, it, I wouldn't be surprised if, we, yeah, all of a sudden instructs some musical. I mean, it's not, there's obviously they're, they make anything to a musical these days. So that's highly possible. But, um, but yeah, it could, for, I, I'd love to see that as a state, as a play, just a straight up play. That'd be great. And I'd like to play the part of Nicholas Cage, although I'm <laughs> probably a bit too old, but we'll see. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's stage. You can play with it. Who yeah. would you? Who would be your ideal Loretta in, in a situation like that? Who would you play against? That is a good question. You know, I, I hmm, uh, Margot Robbie's in my brain, but she's not the one uh, for that. But you know, she does the New York thing pretty good, actually. But that's a good. What? What do you? Who would be a good? Who? Uh, who do you think? I'm thinking if you if you're on stage, then there's a little more room to move in terms of casting. I went like. Patty Lupone, I think, could well, probably crush it. Yeah, yeah, that'd be incredible. If we're doing dream casting. Yeah. Um, or even Marissa Tomei. Marissa Tomei, yeah. yeah. She's actually, yeah, that would be great. Like the goodwill for that sort of performance yeah. too would be amazing. Her, her, what is it, third act now as an actor has been just so wonderful to, to see her yeah. just being this, this fun, yeah. playful, warm presence in, in she, film that can she, still knock it out of the park when she needs still to. Still knock it out of the park and she's she's made it she made it through the thing where they they put actresses at a certain age you know they put them out to pasture and she made it through as she should because yeah. she's amazing but she uh, she made it through by by just sticking to being amazing and it doesn't seem like she's like well i guess i gotta go do this crap like just call it in and not you know i whatever 10 years of some procedural on television or something not that there's anything wrong with that but that's where they tend to put actors yeah. at a certain age. Yeah, absolutely. I I just remember I had occasion to revisit in the bedroom a few months ago and yeah. I had forgotten just how raw and powerful she is. And she's playing a character her own age. Like there's no attempt. She basically found every role for characters who would be that person, like yeah. the corresponding age yeah. and yeah. made them the best thing that she'd ever done over and over and over again. And that's like, that's kind of a miracle. Yeah. Yeah. And especially, you know, she went from my cousin Vinny. She could have had a whole career just doing that. Mm -hmm. Just doing, you know, that kind of, and it, I, I loved that movie when it came out. Um, just whatever that is, that kind of, you, that comedy, that could have been, even if it wasn't with a, you know, thick New York accent or what, she could have just done that forever until they went out again. It was enough, but she was brave. She's yeah. been, because I'm sure she had, you know, probably a ton of offers for that kind of stuff, but she ended up going well where she wanted to go and she stuck it out. And, and, um, and yeah, if you, I feel like if you stick it out and, and stick to doing your best to get better as an actor, eventually people like come around again. Yeah, I've been listening to uh, John Ross Bowie's Household Faces podcast, which is all about character actor work. 
uh, oh. one character actor interviews another, and they all have the same story, which is right around the time they hit their mid forties, they become in demand because all the other people that they were competing with have dropped out to go do yeah. something else. Yeah, people quit. I mean, what happens is people quit, and then who's left is usually. I mean, there's less to choose from, but now everyone's really good. So there, it, it's like there. It dep- it's the competition is almost as stiff, but. People do, there's a trust factor too, because if they're still, they're still here. All right. Um, yeah. oh, they're, and they're, and if they're still trying to working on becoming a, a better actor all the time, then that's the thing about acting is like, if you still, if you continue to apply yourself, you get better. And yeah. actually most actors are who have stuck with it are better from 50 up. They get really good. I mean, look at Anthony Hopkins. And is the father or father like that? Yeah, the father. And now he's in The Son, which is the prequel. That movie, I mean, he is like, that's one of the greatest performances in my mind I've ever seen. And he's, he doesn't have to do that stuff. He's already done it. He doesn't have to. But he goes in there. He's an old man. He gets all those lines down. Does That's hard, hard work. He is so dedicated to it. and, And you see it. It's just beautiful and that would never have happened that doesn't you need the experience you need 45 or 50 years of of work and training to be able to do that for me it's been sort of two things one is i and i tend to be pretty good about just sitting in in like just grinding it out okay this is terrible but i'm just going to keep going and can be a bludgeon for punishment but also I don't love anything more than than acting. You know, I'm sure I'm sure Anthony Hopkins feels the same way. You just love it so much. There's no way you could I could walk away from it. Hey, it's Norm, interrupting my own show to tell you about the latest Shiny Things newsletter, my weekly dispatch about physical media, pop culture, and the odd streaming thing. Last week, I dug into the Criterion edition of Adam McGoyne's Exotica and looked at the new 4K discs of Friday the 13th, The Fun House, Poltergeist, and The Lost Boys because, you know, Halloween's coming. Sign up for a 14-day free trial at shiny-things.ghost.io or find a link at the Simcast Twitter account. Did you miss me writing about movies? I did. Come check it out. Which weirdly enough brings us back to Cher, right? Because yeah. 87 was the year that she sort of diamond points herself into the person that she is, into the, the actor that she is now. Because two years ago, she's showing up. You know, like, was she nominated for Mask? She, was, like, she got the best notices of her career to that point for Mask. And she shows up at the Oscars in the, in the Bob Mackie gown. And it's a whole thing. And she's yeah. still kind of playing with her image and not being a laughing stock, but also refusing to be taken seriously in the same way and then 87 back to back which is of eastwick and moonstruck and she's just like a completely different person it's yeah. that space that lets her reconfigure herself yeah yeah she's i mean like is there a more talented person in the world like there's people who are as talented as we see someone like that you're just like you know she's an incredible singer incredible performer she could just do that. She could have been the, she was the biggest star in the world. Yeah. You know, uh, she could have just done that. And, and to, you know, a lot of musicians, they go, they try acting and, and some excel once, you know, Oh wow. They're really, really good. But to do it over and over again, then, you know, it's a real actor, someone who's really, really happens to be really good at both of those things. And that doesn't come along every day. Kind of have to bow down to that. It just, you can't, it, it can be, it's so, it's weird when someone is so good at things and it seems so effortless, they can almost be, it's easy to dismiss it. Oh, it's just a star doing a star thing. They're just being a movie. There's all this stuff. There's all an infrastructure in place to make them be amazing. It's like, no, it's actually harder when you're at that level. It's harder because there's people don't say, you know, no one's saying no to you. There's no pushback. Um, uh, you have you have to f- you have to find either a, a coach or someone or you're just good at it yourself to humble yourself to the work to the script to the thing and put your stardom aside or whatever I don't know 
I don't have to do that, but I imagine you got to you got to go to set like a normal human being, not thinking you're the you know God's gift to whatever, and do as be the the be a lunch pail actor. I'm here to do my job. What do you need me to do, director? This is you know how, how do we figure this scene out? What do you need? How can we make this the best scene that you know we've ever done? Yeah, I mean, there's no way you can show up to a project like Moonstruck, which has so many moving parts in front of the camera. There's like 12 actors that have to be balanced in most of this. Like everything has to be in sync. You can't just show up and expect to suck up all the oxygen. It's just not going to happen. Or it will, and it'll completely unbalance the movie. Yeah, it will. And she's, you know, there's again, she's acting with legends. Like too, like Olympia Dukakis was a legend then. She had done everything to that point and Cher could still walk in there. She's, she's, she's so like humble, that character, that she's such a, she is a, she's that she is a woman who's going to marry a guy because she's alone. And I guess it's the best thing. It's her best bet. This guy wants to marry her. So I guess I'll marry him as he wants to. And then she meets Nicholas Cage, the one hand, one handed wonder. And, uh, yeah, that kind of stuff. Uh, just uh, I'm always moved by that. Of any any actor, any time, any good performance, anything where you, you know you have to you have to um, kiss the pole or you know, do the thing that it's asking you to do. And sometimes it could be uncomfortable because it's you're going to look bad or it's going to feel humiliating or you're going to lose. There's this this thing in acting where you got to try to win the scene, and I've always I always thought that was weird. Sometimes no, that your job is to lose. You're actually supposed to this whole your whole story is to lose. You you have to be the loser, and you see a lot of good people. They'll they start off hum in their they're just an actor, and then they become a movie star, and they never want to lose. They just want to be a movie star. Mike, I'm this guy. I, I could never lose. I have to be this. This the brand I'm selling. I've never been interested in that like, ever. Like even as a kid, I always just liked I liked actors. Just actors, you know, just that thing, just someone who would do the thing, whatever was asked of them. Yeah, there's like there's movie star acting and then there's acting acting. But the the key to Moonstruck and, and somebody pointed this out about Erin Brockovich winning Julia Roberts the Oscar. The reason she wins is because she starts off as someone who isn't Julia Roberts and then becomes Julia Roberts. It's the it's the equivalent of a training montage. And, and Moonstruck is all about Loretta's transformation into a more glamorous version of herself. And so the trick is, oh, Cher is playing so dowdy. And by the time she turns back into a glamorous version of herself, you'd forgotten it was Cher in the first place. That's the trick, right? Like you're lulled into this, yeah. the performance. Yeah. And she, they, she... Norman Jewison, the whole thing, you're completely convinced that she's not Cher. She's just a, you know, a woman who wears baggy dresses and lives with her parents and um, is comfortable with her humble lot in life. You're completely convinced of that. And it's different watching now because some people don't even know who Cher is at this point. Mm, yes. <laughs> but you're not, wa- you're not watching, you're not, she has yeah you're not watching Cher do this thing you're just watching this woman do this thing and it's like that's Cher doing that that she that's Cher she has one name like that's she's the biggest star in the world especially during that time and again she's not sucking up the air she's just occupying the space she's she's matching everybody else everybody else is matching her and she's giving Nicolas Cage the room to be yeah yeah ludicrously fun Yes, you're not fighting for your. It certainly doesn't seem like she was looking to win an Oscar the entire time. You're like, here, yeah. you're going to win an Oscar. You know, no, she's just doing the thing that she was asked to do, which is play that part, which is, I mean, that's the, you, when you go on set, you want to work with actors like that. And I'm from, from the director right down to the PA, like people, they, they, they all want that. They all want that. It's, 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 it's hard. It's hard to deal with someone on set who's interested only in their uh, who they are. It happens much rarer than people think. That that thing, like that's been my experience. Mm-hmm. I know it does happen, but if I if I, any star I've ever worked with, true A lister, they're usually the nicest, um, 
most gracious people you could work with because their life's for one their life's amazing and they and they know it so they're they're happy to be there they've chosen to be in this movie they want to play this part and most of them understand that if they're the number one the the um the atmosphere of the set or how things are run goes from them and if they're happy to be there then everyone else is happy to be there it's always weird to see stardom find people who aren't ready for it. It doesn't, I mean, I don't think it happens that often either, just because the, the system isn't set up for that. The, the idea that you can be a massive presence with your first film, like even Julia Roberts had a couple of pictures before Pretty Woman. Uh, you could notice her presence and be impressed by it, mm -hmm. but she worked to get to yeah. the A-list. Yeah. And... I mean, obviously, the, the, the thing that's jumping to mind now is God's Country, where Tendi Wayne Newton, who was sort of around for 20 years before she really, like, I think Westworld sort of catalyzed her in a way. I've always been, in, like, ever since flirting, I've just been a huge fan, but I've been watching her, in, and I guess Mission Impossible 2 was the one that was supposed to launch her, but it's the one of those movies that nobody likes, so it just gets forgotten. But to see what she's become as a, as a presence and to sort of grow into this, this ferocity that she's always had. I mean, God's country is we've been selling it on her back because she's the lead, but that's an ensemble piece in its own way too, right? Like everybody who her character interacts with has just as much presence and just as much space in the film. Yeah. The, the, the way the, the, the kind of, magic of the script is that Julian and Shay did so much work to make sure all of the characters were real people. And the more, uh, for me, my experience, experience of it, the more work I, I put in, it, it was a, it was bottomless, just like it is when, when you want to explore yourself, like it's, it's, you're just peeling the onion. Like it's just an endless thing of like, I'm like this. Oh, I didn't know. Oh, I'm also like this. Oh, I, oh, this, oh, I'm like that. Nathan was like that too. It was it, the, the more I discovered, I just could, I kept discovering things about who he was. And because we even had that year break between when we were shut down because of the pandemic, we shot for three weeks and then we were shut down for 367 days. I, I never had a year to sit with a character. And I came back with a, a lot of things, even days before I went back to work, it was like another light bulb went off with like, oh, that's what's going on. And just, it was, and it never felt like, a lot of times you'll feel like you're just putting something you're slapping things on to kind of make there's more stuff there because you feel like you have to this it was just it was i mean i went looking for things but then things just start coming to you it's just or it was felt organic but it's because julian and shay spent all that time making sure that these people were all human beings because that's ostensibly is what the movie's about all of these human beings coming from different places kind of smashing together. Um, and, uh, and to me, that's what's the, the brilliance of it. It's you, you can watch that movie and you certainly can take, I mean, you know, there's, a, it's a neo-Western, there's the good and there's the bad and there's the ugly, but from where I'm standing, I never felt like Nathan was a bad guy. I felt like he was a good guy that does bad things terrible things but I, I but i think we're all capable of doing terrible things we've all done terrible things we don't like to talk about it because we want to present ourselves as perfect but it's the lie it's the lie we all live this lot how are you i'm fine like we we all we have a societal agreement just be like sure someone kind of bullshits you and you bullshit them back and um and then six months later into the relationship, you start actually dealing with the truth. And you're like, wait a second, what? It's like you knew six months ago, as soon as you met the person that was there, now you're angry about it. Like it's, um, it's the thing we always get tripped up by that. And um, what I loved about God's country and Nathan was that um, there was just there's so much heart in the movie and soul and, and compassion i think for um what it is to be alive and to deal with your past and how that comes how that uh smashes into someone else's past when you meet them and are you just 
are you just a product of the things that have happened to you? And are you just going to, is the track already laid in your life that because of the things that happened to you, you're just going to stay on that track. And, um, and yeah, I think you, for me, I saw that that was Nathan, a guy who didn't, he had never left that town. He, he, I'd certainly at one point imagined, I think that there was something out there, but he had to stay there to take care of his mom. And, um, and he sort of, he resigned himself. This is just the way life's going to be, which I, which is much, which is the experience of many humans is like, you know, you're finished high school, you do this, you go to college, you do these things you're supposed to do. Then you get married, then you buy a house, you buy in this, then you have a kid and you ch- 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 goes along. And then either you never wake up one day and go, did I actually want all those things? Or was I just doing it because I'm supposed to do those things? Um, and he's, he's, he's stuck. And he was, he's in, intelligent enough on some level to know um, something's not quite right. He just doesn't know there's an alternative. Just doesn't know there's another way. And, um, and he's just trying to keep things contained to keep his brother in line, to make sure his mom's okay. Uh, with this simmering rage that he's had, you know, from, it's not in the movie. I think there was some reference to it in the church scene and it was cut out, but he talks about his father a little bit and the history of that stuff, the the relationship with his dad. Um, and yeah, so being able to bring all of that, I think we all worked, uh, I mean, I know for sure, Tandy and I, we all worked from a really, really personal place. Like as personal as it's the most personal uh, work I've ever done. Yeah, I kind of feel it. I mean, it, it's something coming through, which is really, uh, you you said he'd never left the town. And what I was going to say is like, he feels like a product of that environment and how harsh and unforgiving that that space is, that wilderness and how we are sort of introduced to it through her character, who who is a transplant, who's sort of doesn't belong there or is constantly being told she doesn't belong there. And it becomes a sort of commentary, not becomes, it is a commentary on nativism and, and the way a community will respond to an outsider. But it's the it's the Western thing, right? The trajectories, as you say, they're all defined long before we ever meet them. And so we're just watching the inevitability. Yeah. Yeah. The the, the tragedy of of the of um of the movie and even of our lives is that do we just end up right where we started and did were we ever actually able to um even move an inch from who our parents were or who our parents parents were and um even economically now like Mm -hmm. that's you know like i don't know i have i don't think i have any friends uh maybe a few you know, really successful friends that are in a different different economic bracket than their parents were. It's a different class structure, more like maybe they've still they're middle class, but they're a little bit, you know, it's all just even that. But but we think we're so different from our parents. It's like, man, my, my father died seven years ago. I've done I did a lot of reflection while he was alive and a lot of reflection since he's passed he passed. And um uh, you know for me the 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 the, the journey is accepting that I am my father's son. I am, I am like my father, but I am not my father. But the more I, instead of pushing the things away that I didn't like about my father, I'm not like that. I've, I, I, I have to learn to accept those things in me in order to forgive my dad. Not that was bad. I wish you didn't, you know, like, and all of the things that are good about me are because they're, uh, because they are in opposition to who my father was. It's like, no, actually all the good things in New York because of the, all of the good and bad things of my dad. Uh, and, uh, and I mean, I brought a ton of that. I mean, that all of, it was a comp, the whole Nathan's, my way in with Nathan was through, was through my relationship with my father for sure. That's what that was. And, uh, and, um, yeah, and his and the loyalty we feel to our parents 
good or bad, mm. whatever they, whether they were amazing parents or, you know, bad parents or, you know, whatever that might be. And the loyalty he felt to his family, you know, even though I'm not sure how much he's getting from them, like how much love or all that stuff or how much they deserve his loyalty. Um, Julian kept saying, like, I think if Nathan had a choice, he'd just be living in the woods by himself, just away from it all. And uh, yeah, I really, that's something I can, I, I understand too. It's like, the and, and it comes fully, uh, that's something I desire, but also the profound loneliness that's also part of that, which I think he's up against as well. Like he's, he's sort of resigned himself that he's going to be alone. And, um, and then this woman shows up and it's my, uh, for me, it was a love story on some level. Like he, this woman has disturbed his, his, his everyday life. And she's, who is this person? He's quite intrigued by her. Um, and, and, um, but it's his, he's has this, his life works a certain way and it's got to stay that way. And she's just ruffling everything up and he just to the point where it kind of explodes and it was like well people do terrible things to the people they love in fact we try to destroy them in some ways all the things we love about them we don't want anybody else to have it so stop doing that stop doing that don't be like that that we especially when you're younger but it can be that can be part of it the threat of this this of this thing in your life that you don't ever want it to leave so you crush it and for him, I think it was just the disturbance of her and his inability to understand his um, attraction, but not, and I don't necessarily mean sexual attraction, but his attraction to her because they, it's the first person he's met that they, he actually has a commonality with on some level. He, mm. he understands him and he understands her. Yeah. yeah. You're, you're, you're the Loretta. That's what yeah. I'm hearing. Like to, to somehow <laughs> awkwardly bring it back. That's exactly yeah. her journey. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, these two people that shouldn't be together, that shouldn't have even met ever. Like, there's no reason why these people ever should have crossed paths, and they do. And there's a nicer ending in Moonstruck than <laughs> in God's country. But um, it's, uh, but both are, both are totally rooted in reality. Both yeah, I feel like we should be very careful about how I cut this sequence. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> When we were done shooting the church scene, Tandy Way came up to me and said, she, she kind of saddled up beside me and she said, oh, she's like, it's so sad. Who, who is that guy and why has he never been allowed to be who he is? And I think, um, you know, we, uh, I'm not a father, but, but in my exploration of all that stuff and my own life and, and, if I ever am lucky to be a dad, lucky enough to be a father, that um, hopefully if I raise a child, it will be who is this person and how can I help them become who they are instead of who do I want them to be and them being a representative of myself. And, you know, Nathan is stuck in that world of wanting to make his mom happy. He feels bad because of the life she had with her, with his dad and the suffering she's had to deal with. And um, growing up in a chaotic, violent environment, he just wants things to be steady and the same every day. Things just can be the same. And uh, just leave me alone. Just leave me alone. Because there's, there's so much stuff going on in him. And it's right there. Um, but he's been able to hide it because his brother's too involved in his own self. And his mom is also involved in her own self as well kind of suffering their way through life and too busy. They can't come up for air because they're dealing with poverty and, and um, the trauma of both their lives and all of those things. And, um, and so there it is. It's sort of the disparate thing of this, of, of what it is to be alive. Where meanwhile, we're all going through this stuff together. We're all suffering together, but, uh, it's our inability to kind of admit it and um, that we're all just kind of struggling. And I feel like that comes up in the church scene. It's like we're fumbling our way through this thing called life. We're all in, we're all in pain. We're all capable of love and happiness. Well, you get stuck. 
you can get stuck and he's very stuck. Yeah. It's I'm trying to come up with a good bullet out, you know, like just a quick, a quick way to sum all of this up, but it really just comes back to the, this film being is as messy. Like yeah. it is as messy a, a script as Moonstruck. It's just that the aesthetic is so much sharper and, yeah. and, and cleaner that it feels it feels controlled from the directorial side in a way that Moonstruck feels controlled from the script, yeah. but it's all about hitting the mood, right? It's all about making sure the audience gets the intention in every scene. Yeah. And, and both you would, could argue, I mean, especially for God's country, but it, Moonstruck too, like there's no clear answer. There's no, mm. like, this is how you got to do it. If only we all did this and life would look like this. It doesn't give you, a, a, they don't give you the answer. Um, there's no clear formula like this is how it, this is this is how life should work, especially God's country. In, in the sense, it it, it actually um, it almost advocates for um, well, our collective humanity that that we actually all want the same things, but because of social norms and. And in this case, you know, racism and ignorance and uh, the way things, well, it's a, should be, this yeah. is how it works here. Don't you, da, da, na, 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 that, the, the rigidness of it. We end up in these places where it's like, I'm right and you're wrong, just based on my, how I feel. And uh, I mean, you know, wars have started obviously over this kind of thing. And um and our and our fear around it you know he's so nathan is very he's a terrified he's a terrified person and when we're scared we do crazy things yeah i think the moral in both films is basically just keep talking yeah yeah i wish we could just keep talking yeah yeah i wish we talked about all kinds of we just don't want to we just want to be right Everybody wants to be right. And so here we are. And I think, and, and it's funny that that was, I, I'm sure Julian told you this, that the movie was a reaction to the 2016 election. And um, which is funny that, that there, this was the reaction, which is, well, we need to talk about stuff, not fuck Trump. And he's wrong. And we're, although, you know, I, I oh, yeah. heard Julian say that, and I've said it before and I'll say it again, fuck Trump. But um but he's the symptom like he's not the cause exactly a hundred percent he is he's just a representative of this thing that that is going on which is this divisiveness thing and it's it's not actually the truth it's not the truth i have a cousin she's a trumper she wants to see god's country i haven't heard any feedback yet (laughs) but you know like there was a time where i was like oh man like i don't know if i'm gonna be able to speak this person ever again trump 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 and it's like man like, I don't, like, she'll do her thing and I'll do my, it's fine. You know, we can both exist in this place. Um, and there's no reason for me to hate her because of this. And there's no reason for her to hate me. I, I mean, beyond, at least not when it comes to politics. Yeah, I'm just, I'm more, I feel a loss more than I feel anger at the people that I've, that have drifted over on that side. Because yeah. 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 it doesn't feel like they can be reached. Yes, yes. Doesn't feel like they can be reached, and they probably feel the same way about us. Yeah, except that we're right. (laughs) (laughs) My thanks to Yoris Jarsky, who you can and should see in God's Country in theaters in the U.S. and Canada right now. You can find American Showtimes at godscountryfilm.com, and the Toronto screening info is online at tiff.net. You can find Yoris on Twitter at Yoris Jarsky, all one word, and you can find Moonstruck on disc in the Criterion Collection in a very nice special edition. It's also available on Blu-ray and DVD from MGM Home Entertainment and streaming on HBO Max in the U.S. And it's also available to rent or buy on various VOD platforms in the U.S. and Canada. As always, you can find me on Twitter at Norm Wilner, and you can find this podcast there at Simcast, S-E-M-Cast, and on the web at someoneelsesmovie.com. The first year of the podcast is still available for just 20 bucks at payhip.com slash semcast. That's the first 52 episodes of someone else's movie, 45 of which aren't currently available anywhere else. And check out my newsletter, Shiny Things, at shiny-things.ghost.io. I think you'll enjoy it. Our theme song is by the last year. If you like it or the show in general, please say so. Leave a review wherever you've been listening. Every little bit helps. It truly does. And check out the other shows on the Frequency Podcast Network while you're doing that. Stay safe. 
watch movies, wear a mask if you go out, get your booster when you can. I'll see you next week.